Hey, what's up, Internet? It's Chris Krug from CBC Sandboxing AI, and I'm here on Reconciliation Day with Michael Running Wolf. Say hi to the Internet, Michael, and introduce yourself, please. Hey, Chris. I'm Michael Runnemuth. I am an AI researcher for the First Languages AI Reality Initiative, and we're doing language reclamation using artificial intelligence. Can you tell me a little bit more about that initiative? Yeah, so the objective is to build XR technology, language education technology using artificial intelligence. So the next would be the goal being that we put on a headset and you're able to speak into the headset and experience an immersive exp um, in the world within your own language. And we're working on the fundamental AI technology right now to enable AI for indigenous languages. And this is speech to text by AI. Talk to me about some of the unique things when it comes to AI and indigenous languages. What are some of the unique considerations that you're dealing with? The biggest one is just a general lack of data. We don't have large amounts of information like you'd have for English or French or German where they have millions of hours of annotated audio and and so for large AI infrastructure you typically require tens of thousands to millions of hours of annotated labeled audio, basically transcribed audio and for indigenous languages we just don't simply have that and so we're developing technology that works with very sparse data sets and also addressing some algorithmic problems with current strategies that simply but so the, the basic premise here is that artificial intelligence for speech to text or automatic speech recognition AI doesn't actually work for indigenous languages even if we did have millions of hours of annotated audio it doesn't work so we actually have to develop new algorithms and new strategies and for machine learning what are some of the reasons why that it doesn't work for indigenous languages in the same way it does for other languages one of them is our morphology is very different. So if you think of what is automatic speech recognition technology look for any language, and so you need phonetic data, data that's uh, audio and the sounds of the language, and you also need the morphology documentation. And so typical in the large automatic speech recognition systems like Siri or Alexa or Google Assistant, you have a large text corpus. They use a statistical strategy that assumes that you have a finite small dictionary or like for English it's about 50,000 words and you build a statistical model basically a bell curve of incidences and so when you're interacting with your you know chatting and iMessage or on chat or MMS you know when it you know that audio with the you know when you're typing it and it says the next it predicts the next word that's yeah. what that is that big text the statistical corpus for indigenous languages in north america we actually have an infinite amount of words mm -hmm. and so that algorithm doesn't simply work for us so it's actually been tried the inductive people have a very large data set that in theory would work but actually from an algorithmic perspective doesn't work simply because there's an incompatibility with the strategy being employed now and so that's where the fundamental research goes in right now we're working on frontline, very early technology that's never been researched before. <laughs> Amazing. Are there some unique ethical challenges when it comes to looking at indigenous languages and AI and doing development and stuff? Yeah, so a big component of this research is respecting the the sovereignty of the communities we're working with. Uh, so this this isn't, fundamentally, this isn't tweets. This isn't Instagram posts. This isn't Facebook. We're working with raw data that are people's cultural identities, songs, and sacred stories, and there's a special requirement. And so I, it's part of our policy that we allow the communities to retain ownership of the data. And I mean, what that would mean is that you think that'd be a baseline, but actually in AI research, like when you sign up for Facebook or Twitter or whatever it's called now, X, you actually sign away your rights to every, all your user behavior on these platforms is being given away to the company so they can train their own AI. We don't like that model because that also means that we're trying to take possession over their community data. So as part of our work, we're drafting a contract that basically says all the data that's collected, all the data that's created remains with the community. And so at the end of the research, our objective is to create algorithmic breakthroughs, not exploit the community's intellectual property resources. Mm -hmm. I've heard some people talk about indigenous languages always have been embodied and upon the land, often not always written down or, or, or even, uh, as you said, like infinite words, infinite uh, phonology. How do you kind of deal with these types of feelings? Yes. So in XR, virtual reality, 
we have the opportunity to demonstrate the language and context, the cultural context. So like I'm Lakota and Cheyenne from Montana and my dad's from South Dakota and I've been able to put out a headset and experience of Lakota cultural experience with obviously retaining to the respect of what the community wants. It offers us the opportunity to actually present the languages in context in the where, where it actually makes sense. So you really, you really think about, we're working with languages in the Northwest here on Vancouver Island and then across the border in Washington state. And these are canoe uh, societies. And so their languages have created around the canoe journey and the experience of living in the Northwest coast and fishing and all that. And so their words and the morphology and the, the, is actually shaped by the environment. And it's a very different language than Lakota and Cheyenne, who are Plains, Great Plains languages. And so I think that's where XR offers the ability to allow the language to flourish in the digital space, but also be within context of what they're meant for. Yeah, it's beautiful. I know you're doing some work with Mila, and they're one of the leading ethicists. AI ethicist firms, kind of, or nonprofits in the whole wide world, advancing work around AI ethicists. So what, what type of work are you doing there? Yeah, so they are our collaborators. We are working with them. So this project is cross-border, where we have a, a 501c3 that I co-founded called Indigenous, and that's the fiscal sponsor in the United States, because we're working with tribes uh, south of the border. And then up here in Canada, we're working with Mila and some other partners like Simon Fraser University to develop this AI research because it's cross-border. And so this allows us, you know, it's a practical requirement where we need to bring in money from Canada and also donations from the states. And Mila provides actually a good ground framework for also the, the, the artificial intelligence research. Because what we're doing is very early stage research and Mila has set up for that. So, and it, it may be unsurprising, it's actually the largest AI research lab in the world. It's incredible. And having been associated with that, having their support and backing has been instrumental. It's amazing. Yeah. I, I heard you talk the other night at the Vancouver AI meetup and you were talking, you said a couple of things that really opened people's mind. You talked about the low amount of PhD computer science students, I believe, coming through the programs that are indigenous and kind of your reflections upon that. Would you just take it from the top there? Yeah, there actually may only be five First Nations computer scientists in college right now. There's more of us in industry, more of us, you know, outside of academia, but there's very few of us, period. We graduate across the CRA Talbay survey monitors this and they survey all the universities in Mexico, the United States and Canada. And of the 1,700 typical PhD graduates per year, we graduate maybe one or two, often none at all. And so we just have this career pathway that is missing. And, and if we should make up, we are the largest minority in Canada, but we are the least represented in STEM fields and computer science across all of Canada, academically and in the in industry. And what can we do about that? I think what we need to do is demonstrate, bring the technology to the community. There is this bias towards remote training. You know, there's a lot of energy and effort by the government and in the industry to reach minority candidates, underrepresented of the communities in through remote learning. But for the most part, that doesn't work for us because we just face issues of number one, we don't have very great in connectivity. So if you look at the map of all the reserves in Canada, most of us are in the far north. You know, like 80% of all Canadians are within one to two hour driving distance of the American border. And majority of us indigenous people are far north of that. And so we just don't have the basic infrastructure that um, other communities in Canada have. And particularly with one of our partner communities, we're working with Gwich'in, which is in the Northwest Territory. And they literally have to fly most of their resources in on an airplane that's very costly never mind from a you know carbon offset um, point point of view but also it's just economically difficult for them to get the uh, typical resources that we take for granted here in vancouver and so we need technology that addresses that and also educational experiences that uh, reaches that far and it's really hard to get a computer science professor to live in yellow knife you know, that's really hard so we need the a holistic strategy that solves for that. And so part of our research, it's not the primary goal, but part of our research is actually giving communities the opportunity to learn for about what we're doing. And so like one of the things we do, which is really quite obvious, is we teach them how to document their own languages. So we were are working with a Kwakwala language community, the Kwakulo in Northern Vancouver Island, 
and we they've been this language has been studied for over a hundred years, and the whole field of linguistics was actually defined upon research upon this language. It's a very complex language. It's also why we're researching it. And in all these century or nearly a century of research, no one ever taught these community members how to document their own language from a scientific perspective. And they were so excited that we were willing to teach them this tool called Elan that's created by the Max Planck Institute in Germany. But it's just basics like that. And so we're teaching our communities how to document their own language, how to understand the complex morphology of their own languages on the scientific. These are things that they know intuitively, so it's actually not hard to teach them this stuff because they know it already intuitively. We're just giving them the scientific background to really understand what's going on with the language. And you're also doing that from an AI perspective because some of the challenges really do need the community input for us to solve. Like, we can't, we can't do this in isolation. There has been... And not to be critical, so I won't name them, but there's been millions of dollars being spent by research institutions in Canada that have gotten nowhere on this problem. Like, why haven't we solved this problem yet, despite millions of dollars of uh, Canadian and American research? It's because they do this research in isolation. They're sitting in a lab. They have the data. They're trying to create AI you know, infrastructure, um, morphology, or the morphological research without community input. And that's sort of what gives us our so-called advantage is that we're working with communities, getting them to understand them, what they need, and being informing the research based upon their needs and their interests. I know there's a lot of First Nations youth out there that are interested in computers, they're interested in AI, they're interested in their culture and their language and stuff. How would you help on-ramp these kids into a world that you're living in? I think we need to go to them. So in the States, in South Dakota, I'm a co-founder of this project called Lakota AI Code Camp. And so every summer for the past three years, we've been teaching Lakota kids, you know, how to do AI. So in all of South Dakota, in North Dakota, and Montana, and Nebraska, and Minnesota, in the whole area, the, it's surprising there's no computer lab. There actually is no lab for anyone that would. You can go into the lab and teach AI. And so what we had to do was get a bunch of computers and fly them out to the students and teach them on the, like, basically gaming computers so they can run AI. And I think we need to replicate that in, here in Canada, like on a more systemic uh, basis, because that's, you know, if you think about the economic uh, output of a computer scientist versus, you know, someone who does a vocational work, and nothing against welders, you know, and that's a really important work, but... It also is a career limiting if you don't have access to higher ed, high technology, higher ed training. And so we'll, we'll uplift these communities. And, you know, COVID has taught us that all you need is a really good internet connection and you can be a productive member of the, the information age. And so what we really need to do is an intensive holistic strategy of bringing the technology to the communities, enabling them to teach the curriculum. And um, luckily, I actually have curriculum. We've developed it already. We already have a strategy, the pedagogy, and we've been doing this for three years in South Dakota. And these are kids who are similar to First Nations students up here in that they don't have internet access. They don't have access to computer science education. And neither does any South Dakota student, for that matter, actually. And we, we just brought laptops out to them and taught them how to use them. And every single graduate who's come through our, our system has gone on to teach studying computer science in college. Ooh. And so we have like a 100% success rate for every senior who's gone through our program mm, for getting them into college. It's beautiful. Good work, man. We respect, the, respect the things you're up to quite a bit. Who do you look up to? Who else out there in the world of kind of indigenous AI are voices that we should tune into and lift up? Yeah, I think a lot of my research, a, a big shout out goes to a Maori research group called Tehiku Media. I'll introduce them. Actually, they'll be here in December at NeurIP. So I, I'm the founder of Indigenous and AI, and we basically it's a workshop at NeurIP, the biggest AI conference in the world. And we invite speakers from all across the world who are Indigenous doing community impact for research. And so we can't, when we get our system up and running, we can't claim to be the first Indigenous automatic speech recognition AI. It's actually the Maori. They beat us way back in 2018. And a lot of our research and strategy derives from them, and there are mentors. And yeah. uh, maybe we can do this again in December. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd yeah. love to. Yeah, they're leaders in a lot of uh, cultural things. They really look up to it. 
I was uh, amused and, and challenged a little bit the other night hearing you talk about the cargo cult concept. So uh, I think that's kind of a funny thing. And uh, would you just kind of introduce us and tell us a little bit what you're talking about there about the cargo cult? Yeah, I think artificial intelligence has taken on this flavor of there's a lot of hope and hype around the capabilities of AI. And in the near term future, I think I'm not a, 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 I'm skeptical, but I'm not delusionally skeptical. Eventually, we're going to have thinking machines, sentient AI. I do not believe large language models is the strategy. And there's a couple of reasons why I think that. Number one is that we, it takes a lot of data to build a large language model. And the theory is that if you give enough data to these models, these generative AI models, it's going to spontaneously, through emergence, emergent intelligence, which is you know a mathematical phenomenon, it's going to wake up. The problem is that it hasn't happened, and they already have all our data. You know these corporations that are building large language models like Meta and Google and Microsoft and et cetera, et cetera. You know Amazon, everyone's playing. They already have all our data. They already have all the petabytes of human behavior at their fingertips. And they haven't created it yet. So I think we don't have enough data. There's probably not enough data in the world. And there's been research that's been highlighted in scientific articles about we probably need 100 times more data than we have now. So that's basically another 100 Earths worth of human data. And so the strategy, we probably don't have the scale of data. And so coming back to your original question, there's just physical limitations to what we can do with this current strategy. And that's not to say we won't figure it out. There's, there's probably a different algorithmic strategy we need to do that doesn't require, you know, you know, several million petabytes of human data. <laughs> and if you actually remember at the top of all this, we'd be horrified that that's human surveillance data. People, all our behavior and user interactions are being, it hasn't happened. So we don't have enough data. Those are the physical reasons why it's not that. So now let's go back to this idea of a cargo cult. And the cargo cult originates from, there's this tribe, and I encourage you just to Google it because we don't have time to go into it here, but Basically, this tribe was became enamored with American military aircraft, and they recreated a working, they mimicked a working airport using bamboo and you know and trees, because they were hoping to lure airplanes back. And you know, like what happened there was that the American military accidentally gave them the impression that they were doing some ceremony that would invite planes to bring in goodies from the states, you know. And so they they came, and so this cult emerged where. They recreate the ceremonies, or what they thought were ceremonies, of uh, the airplanes coming in and dropping off um, um, supplies, and they're basically waiting for the airplanes to come back. Because they and what what happened there is because the community wasn't actually given agency. What's really been going on? They were never really informed what, what, why was these airplanes coming there? And it's because there was some American nuclear military research. And similarly, I see an analogs that in AGI, mm-hmm. we. We as consumers of artificial intelligence and users, if you're not within the field, you're being told that this is this magical, wonderful technology and you have all this hope and hype and people are seeing things that aren't really there. And it's creating this phenomenon where we're treating it, we're, we're becoming cargo cultists. We're, we're being, and some of it's intentional, but for the most part, it's unintentional. So these large language model creators in a kind of tech company are colonizing our minds in the sense that they're teaching us that there's this mysterious blob that has all these capabilities, but it doesn't actually. And so it's not magic. There's just fundamental math going on here. We, we're not going to have AGI anytime soon. It's certainly not on the horizon of six months unless there's something going on that I'm completely unaware of. And and we're being sold basically a lie, and we're not be, we're not being fully informed. And this is because we're not fully informed of how these systems work. And it's not for a lack of trying. Like if you really wanted to know, Meta has an amazing web series explaining the Llama system. So does Microsoft and Google. But but then if you ignore that, you still see all the hype of like we're, this is going to transform our lives and the world. But it actually hasn't. Like it's interesting to create pictures of prairie dogs using prompts on, you know, Chet Jaren up on Dali or any of like the stable diffusion models. But for the most part, that's about it. You know, they're spending billions of dollars on toys right now. And it really hasn't transformed, hasn't quite arrived. 
It's very expensive. Like Microsoft has been spending $13 billion a quarter on this technology. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot to swallow for a no profit. So it's like you can keep LARPing like uh, a, de a deity is going to come from the machine, but uh, it doesn't seem like that. Maybe you're just all kind of playing a charade down there, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's it's an interesting phenomenon. It's not like I don't think it's useful because we are using... Yeah, I, want to, I'm, I'm gonna, I, I just want you to help me square the circle between the research that you're doing with AI around cultural preservation and language revitalization and the stuff that you're being more critical of when it comes to generative AI not living up to its promises. So first off... We are using quite a bit of generative AI in our technology, and it's actually pretty nuanced. We're not, you know, there are strategies of creating synthetic data. We're not doing that because actually it doesn't really work very well for our data set. But we are using transformers, you know, which is the fundamental building block of generative AI. And we're also using, you know, some strategies that have been outlined in how these large language models are being created. So there are utility in there, and it's allowing us to amplify our data, but it's, and that's just practical, pragmatic stuff. And there's a ton of that, actually. There's a lot of really interesting down-to-earth research that's being used using transformer technology across the world, you know, like in climate change and also, and, you know, like I read a really interesting paper about these communities using generative AI for protecting their riparian ec uh, ecologies, you know, rivers and all that. But what's the, the disconnect is that you have this very practical utility and it's basically a really nice shovel. If you think of it that way, the metaphor here is a really great shovel. It's amazing. It's like this really fast, really amazing, you know, impactful, dynamic shovel. But it's still at the end of the day, it's a shovel. You know, don't fall in love with the chatbot. Don't fall in love with your shovel. Like, sure, you can maybe have a particularly romantic, this is Canada, so you might have a particularly romantic, you know, confidant in your, your ex, you know, the typical stereo, woodsman ex. But it's at the end of the day, it's just a technology. It's just a tool. It's not actually doing anything more than it was ever actually designed for. And that's where it's missing. Like, what is AGI, artificial general intelligence? It's a tool that would suddenly decide to do things on its own beyond what you originally designed it for. And that's what we're trying to unlock with this technology. We're not there yet. We're just making really elaborate shovels that are really good at what they do. We don't have technology that's self-generated and self-introspective. And, and yes, there's some really interesting work coming out of generative AI. Like there's a, there's a role chat bot that can write papers. Um, Scientific research papers. Yeah, and what's really going on is that if you think about research, and I know we're kind of off topic here, but if you think about research and you have two threads of research, one going one way, and another thread going that way. And the generative AI is really good at crossing the bridge between the two. And it's actually a hallucination. So it's not actually doing fundamental new research. It's just crossing the bridge between two streams of work. And it's really just a hallucination. And sometimes these hallucinations are substantive. Like there might actually is a work stream between the two that we haven't discovered yet just simply because it hasn't been done yet. And, and that's different than something that's completely tangential to everything that you're doing. Like if you have two work streams at 90 degree angles, it's not going to find the Z axis. It's, it's just not going to happen. Maybe with sentient AI, we would have that. It's really just finding things that are co-occurring on the same plane, if you think of it that perspective. Amazing. Well, thank you very much for your time. <laughs> that got very nerdy toward the end. <laughs> no, I, I love it, man. I love it. I think that's definitely where we wanted to go here. So that concludes this interview. Thank you. That was awesome. Actually, before we go, is there anything else you wanted to say or add about the work you see going on out there or just anything else in general? Yeah, I think it's going to become very important for your career to understand fundamentally what AI is doing. And so I encourage the viewers and listeners, they probably are probably more researched than the next, but really look at what is going on underneath so that you as a as you're developing your career and going into the future, like how can you use these technologies within your personal life and also within your career? And really understand the limitations. You know, I think it's going to be really easy for you to have a leg up over your competition, be it in corporate or even like in the office, just to understand that you know, you know the um, generative AI isn't useful for certain tasks. And if you know that, then you're really ahead of the game right there. Yeah. And I think if people have some concerns that learning the vocabulary and the, the structures of how it works and what's going on under the hood will help them be a part of that conversation in the future as well. Yeah, and so we just try to be, a, don't be a cargo cultist. You're just trying to avoid being delusioned and disillusioned with by the, the hype. The hype 
there's a lot of hype. You know, the, the, these generative AI technologies right now really aren't super useful for the average person other than creating, you know, interesting DALI images or the stable diffusion models and and really understanding the limitations now as it becomes more and more integrated within our economy, you'll be have a leg up in the future. Cool. Yeah. All right, thank you very much, Chris Krug and Michael Ronnie Wolf on Canada's National Truth and Reconciliation Day from Vancouver, BC. Over and out.